Who writes who writes the TAF at K KTCM now? Who's the question? Davis Montham. Pardon? Davis Montham Air Force Base does the, the Davis report. Davis Montham writes All the military yeah, okay. forecasts, all the terminal aerodrome forecasts for the West Coast come from Davis Montham Air Force Base. The people at McCord don't do it. In fact, rumor has it they're going to go down to two civilians there and no more military. I've heard that that might be the case. It might be all civilians there. Has anybody uh, suggested anything radical like the Seattle office forecast? I haven't heard that. Uh, I haven't heard. Military forecast, the actual CAF forecast, is different than the uh, National Weather Service one. Well, because we have altimeters and temperatures. We have another question? Uh, this is a little tangential. It's kind of nostalgia. When I was a young person, Chuck Wise was a little kid on television doing the weather. Can you kind of... <laughs> Reprise that for us. Uh, I'm not sure what you want me to say. Uh, well, how old were you, and how did you have to be on TV as a young, as a young child? Uh, just an interest in it, uh, the ability to ad lib, I guess. And uh, I guess I was affectionately known back in that time when I did television weather as a troublemaker. And I thought that was because of my involvement in my own uh, independent forecasting. And I thought after I left the business, I would lose that title. But uh, I guess not. Here I am again. <laughs> He's back. Back from more trouble. Any questions for the National Weather Service earlier? Jeremiah is still here, or Wolf Reed? By the way, thanks, Wolf, for coming all the way down here. That was awesome. Um, so, okay, we do have. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, you know, I, I just had a quick question about the the temperature records that you're talking about, and uh, I'm kind of on board with where you're going with this. But one of the things you suggested were the, the land temperature records from observations completely being blown out of the water because there's just no factual evidence to support where the, the, the climate scare tactics are going. With the change in instrumentation, could you equally throw out all the observations, even in your own, um, in improving your own theories, would you, could you even throw that out completely because you, you just can't, um, um, you can't account for the, 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 the change in instrumentation and the, the standardization. Uh, Would you almost want to remove them completely from any argument, pro or con, global warming? Uh, no, and the reason for that is because Anthony Watts, who is a, another meteorologist who has looked at this problem, and it's, it's up on his website, uh, he looked at, at the uh, ASOS instrumentation since the modernization and restructuring of the weather service took place. There are significant problems with the instrumentation that don't meet Weather Service observing standards any longer. And he wrote this up extensively and criticized it. But what we found is the biases are all warm, not cold. And so that's part of the reason why uh, some of this land-based temperature record, depending on what parts of it you use, what parts of it you don't use, can show different things. Uh, but in terms of a falling temperature, if anything, it's reducing the amount of falling if you included that data. So I, I don't think it makes it irrelevant at all. It actually strengthens my argument if, if you wanted to look at it that way. If the bias was the other way, then yes, I would seriously question the use of this, and I probably, without careful reconsideration, I would just I wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't want to do it. But based upon where they found the biases, no, I don't think it affects uh, this this at all. So that's my take on it. Let me get you a mic here. Go ahead. Is it known approximately how, how much money has been given in grants to scientists who produce uh, uh, reports that say that we have global warming? Uh, it's a considerable amount. The estimates are we're getting north of $100 billion since they started it, the, uh, you know, the getting the research grants. And I don't object to them, you know, to scientific research grants, but uh, I have to say that uh, you can have a theory, and, and they did when they invented climate models. Those, by the way, were contradictory to everything we learned as undergraduate students in the 70s, because Walthall Sasser's work from Harvard uh, never alluded to the fact that uh, CO2 could control water vapor and cause warming like the climate models forecast that it could. Nonetheless, they spent the money to invent them, so give them a fair shake and say, okay, let's run them and see what they do. Well, we've done that. And now the evidence shows the modeling is, is a dismal failure which a lot of meteorologists would have told them that from day one, but they wanted to spend the money anyway. They may be able to develop some improvements in them in the future where they actually do more than they're able to do now, 
But uh, my objection to it now is that now that you've had your, your test runs and you see that the modeling has failed, it's time to admit this. Uh, my frustration with it is we can't get these people that are getting that money to ever admit this. They keep saying the modeling is more accurate over observations, and by, that's absurd. But that's some of the claims we're getting from it now. If it's spent wisely, you know, sure. But right now, I think we're wasting money, and if we're going to continue to spend it on climate research, it needs to be refocused on, on really finding out what causes the climate to change, and I'm suspicious that the sun has a lot to do with this. We're going to talk about that in November. Question in the back. Um, I have two points I'd like to make. First, how uh, uh, Dr. Fultz began his, um, <clears throat> the first fact mentioned by Fultz was not quite correct. The, um, <clears throat> In 1968, at, I believe, the University of Virginia, Charlotte, on Earth Day, a talk was given by O.C. Herfindahl, who's resource for the future, on CO2 emissions and basically the change in the Earth's libido. So that predates Thatcher by quite a bit. He, was, he had gotten the work from other people, because he was an economist, not a physicist, um, working on resources. At the end of your last your last slide, um, Mr. Weiss, the last slide you had happened to pick the years very carefully. 1998 was the beginning of a downtrend, which had been point, and it was you know, a minor downtrend compared to the few years before that. Before that. I wanted to make those two points, began and ended, and ended on, shall we say, fairly carefully chosen points. Well, okay, let's take a look at this. These are not ch carefully chosen points. I disagree because they, the, the starting point is 98 up till now, which does show what I was trying to do in showing that is simply identify when the downtrend and the temperatures began. And it's right around 1998. Now, what's the purpose of doing that? Sure, I could pick, you could pick starting points and end points that might show a little bit of difference, but the point is, in that 10 years, you lost 0.95 degrees on the temperature record. And that is a major contradiction to climate modeling. And that is why I chose to show this. The modeling is forecasting the temperature to continue to rise with CO2. There were no forecasts made by the IPCC or any other of these people that engage in climate alarmism that forecasted these temperatures to go down. So their modeling has failed, and they don't want to admit it. And there's no other way you can explain it. And if somebody has a better explanation, I'd certainly be willing to listen to it. But that's why I chose the time period. November 29, mark that on your calendar. They're going to have two hours at our AMS meeting on that day. So, and you welcome all sorts of questions on that day, Greg. Right? Since we are a little limited in our time here today, uh, okay. Well, we've heard a bit about politics and money. I understand the Koch brothers have spent 50 million dollars supporting uh, climate deniers, along with who knows how much Exxon, Texaco, and so forth spent on the same cause. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Yes, uh, I would love to get a check from the Koch brothers, but unfortunately they don't employ me. Uh, you know what, what kind of consideration I've received for my work that I've done on this? Zero. Zero. Yeah. I do it only because uh, I'm very disappointed in climate alarmists and how they misrepresent the temperature record of the Earth, how they misrepresent the use of climatological data, and how they don't admit that they're wrong when, when the evidence shows otherwise. And uh, the most disturbing thing to me is the fact that these people have found their way into government and they're creating public policies that affect all of us. Now, if you want to sit and talk about alarmism and the climate's doing this or the climate's doing that, you can do it all day, and I don't really care. Uh, I'll listen to it if it's reasonable, but what bothers me is when you're making public policy that somebody else has to pay for, and they want to change the way we, we live our lives, you have to really be careful about why you're doing this. And when the evidence doesn't show or point in any sort of favor towards this, that's the whole reason why I'm up here on the podium. As a meteorologist, I feel it's my duty to speak out about this when I know what the truth is, and that's the only reason why I'm here. I'm not getting a dime for this, and I'll just continue to do it as long as the record supports what it supports, and I think that it's going to. 
Yeah, Thank you, I'd uh, just like to know, uh, get a response from you. I've heard this argument from the pro-global warming side that many of the scientists that have signed on to the statement saying that global warming is not a truthism are actually not climatologists, meteorologists, or atmospheric scientists, and therefore their views aren't really that valid or as valid as theirs, the global warming side. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. You know, the unfortunate thing about our profession is that we never had any body in government uh, regulate us like they do engineering and medicine. Uh, there's all kinds of people that run around and call themselves certain things and say they're an expert, like in, in climate. If you take a look at the people that say they're climate scientists, we've got our own group in Oregon that I, I don't know what their qualifications to speak about the subject really are. Uh, the most vocal I've heard uh, that are on the other side of this issue, uh, Bob Doppler from the University of Oregon, has got a PhD in social sciences. Uh, Jane Lachenko, who uh, was a researcher at Oregon State University, she's got a PhD in zoology, but she's a climate scientist. And uh, uh, George Taylor's supervisor, Mark Abbott, his was in ecology. And I don't even know what that is. I don't think the major was offered when I was going to Oregon State. But uh, at any rate, these people run around, they say, well, we're a climate scientist, and so they, they say because of a, just because of an academic position or degree that they're qualified to speak about it. I suppose you can say what you want, but that doesn't qualify somebody necessarily just because they have a PhD. And so, yeah, it's unfortunate, but that, uh, that's what's going on in the, in the climate science arena. There's a lot of people who can get grant money, and uh, they can say they're a scientist, but uh, they don't really study all the things that... Meteorologists have to study to become degreed, or people in physics like Gordon Coates, which atmospheric science borrows almost exclusively. We got five minutes left. So, two. Well, my questions was similar, but it, when I went to Oregon State, the state climatologist took care of the state climate record. And I know I've gone to the Oregon Climate Services, and I don't think the state climate record's been kept up since George Taylor was the state climatologist. I've, it, it concerns me because having an accurate record of what's going on now is still needed, but I, I don't know that you can address that. Right. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Either, I, either, uh, I've talked with colleagues about uh, one of the things we wanted Phil Moat to tell us was since uh, George left and he took over that position with the Climate Change Research Institute, we don't know exactly what it is that Phil does. And I don't know whether he's keeping the records or whether, um, you know, so far, no evidence of that, and that's, that's tragic because we do need an accurate climate record of the Northwest, and when George was working for us, he did meticulous work, and he was, we lost a jewel in terms of the, the kind of stuff he did for, for, the, for the state. Uh, Chuck, I, I uh, believe uh, you said that the climate uh, change models uh, were, were largely wrong. As I recall, most of the uh, climate change models show the greatest amount of warming in the northern regions, north of the 50 degree latitude. Um, and uh, I wonder if uh, you'd uh, be able to show us uh, graphs of uh, the last two or three decades in the uh, uh, northern part of the northern hemisphere where the uh, climate change models are predicting the greatest amount of warming. Okay, uh, yeah, actually, we're going to get into that November 29th because I do have the records. I've got Phil Moat's climate model projections that he made in the 90s, and I've got the ones when they first came out in the 80s. But then there's, there's, problems, there's problems with the Arctic uh, temperature stuff. Uh, we've been questioning a lot of the things that Jim Hansen did with that data, and I'm not convinced at all that what he claims happened up there is what, is what has actually happened with the temperature record because they use a gridding system and a weighting system of some kind where they're taking geographical areas and estimating what the temperatures were rather than actually having thermometers up there. And uh, there are people who have looked at that data who are saying, I don't know about it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not necessarily uh, what Jim Hansen wants us to believe that it is. You can go to site, websites right now and you can look at the Danish website, which keeps track of Arctic temperatures, and has a complete database that goes all the way back like a hundred years or something. It's, it's an incredible database. I would encourage you to go there because if you look at that record, you'll find that there's nothing un, uh, unprecedented that's happened in the Arctic in terms of any warming. The temperatures way up in north of the Arctic Circle where the ice is are very stable and have been for like over a hundred years. The melting uh, doesn't seem to be a, a, a result completely of the, of the uh, ambient air temperature above the ice. It seems to be related to the ocean. 
And in fact, uh, there was a, when I was at the climate conference in Chicago just a couple of years ago, really interesting video uh, that was presented by an oceanographer at that conference that showed he tracked it with satellites. The Kelvin waves from the uh, El Nino activity, which occurred during the warm phase from uh, like, it was uh, the last warm phase went from 79 until around 98 or so. Uh, he tracked uh, the Kelvin waves and the ocean, warm ocean water and actually tracked it going northward as it sloshes against the eastern shores of uh, South America. It goes all the way up and then channels itself into the Arctic. And uh, he's, he's hypothesizing that that warm water is what's actually increasing the melting during the summer. It's, it's related to things like this more than it is actual ambient temperatures above the ground. One final question. <clears throat> Some years ago I heard a report that state, state climatologist, I think George, the one was referring to, was forced by the governor, the Democratic governor at the time, to, to resign because of his position on global warming. Uh, he wasn't forced to. I think that's an unfair assessment, but what happened was they didn't want him there. He was a thorn in the side to what Oregon State University wanted and the governor's office wanted because they opened up, when, they, when George left, the governor promised to open up the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute. Now, that, they're getting funding by you know, $2 million by the state uh, to uh, take over the stuff supposedly that, that, that George did. But I don't know if they're actually even doing that. And, and nobody really knows right now what Phil does. I mean, uh, I think that's a very relevant question, and he should come to one of the meetings and tell us, give us an outline of what, what kind of data we can get out of the Research Institute, because we're paying a lot of money for it. And so uh, if it's costing us a lot more to run it, then there should be the same or better quality of data out of it that George was providing. And right now, you know, I don't see it. Okay, I hate to cut everybody short, but it is 3.15. And thank you to Dr. Folks and to uh, Chuck Wise. Mark your calendars down Tuesday, November 29th, 7 to 9 p.m., two hours here at OMSI. Thank you, Jim Todd. Thank you, OMSI. Please take your trash. Thank you.